Well, hi, everyone. I want to uh, welcome you to the K-12 chat. And today, uh, we're very fortunate to have with us Colleen McInerney. Hopefully, I said that correct. Who okay. is a math education specialist at Tuba Labs. And Colleen is going to demonstrate for us uh, their approach to trying to help teachers uh, use a pedagogical approach to teaching their lessons using data. And with that in mind, I'm just going to turn it over to Colleen and let her show you the wonderful things that you can do in Tuba. Uh, and I think she's going to demonstrate for us the different lessons that they have that are open access for everyone. So Colleen, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Chris. Um, hello, welcome. Um, as we are getting started, please uh, feel free to drop in the chat um, your name, where you're calling in from, and what you teach. Um, it's going to help me know, first of all, who's in the room. Um, second of all, um, what are going to be the most helpful things I can share with you today as we look at um, Cuba and all of the different things that we offer on our platform. Um, oh, I see a fellow VA person. I am also from Virginia. Um, great. So please, please feel free to continue dropping that into the chat, uh, just who you are, where you're from, and what you teach. Um, help us to know who is in the room. And I thought I'd introduce myself to begin, just so you know who you're talking to. Um, my name's Colleen. Like Chris said, I am the math education specialist at Tuva, which means I handle all of the math side of our product um, in terms of like creating new content, teacher professional development, and working with schools and districts to support them in using Tuva. But before that, I was a classroom teacher um, for seven years and worked in public schools for an additional three. Um, I taught uh, eighth grade math, eighth grade science, algebra one, and geometry. Um, so very entrenched in the STEM world um, and was really excited to find two as an opportunity, something I wish I had found while I was still in the classroom. Um, lots of great opportunities to um, use data to teach um, in particular algebra one, which is my, my passion. Um, so uh, just a little bit about me. I will reshare my email with you all at the end of our time today. Um, and I just wanted to say that my proverbial email door is always open. If you leave the session and feel like you have additional questions or you want some support in figuring out ways that you can incorporate Tuba into what you're already doing in your classroom, I would love to be a thought partner with you. So I'll share that um, information with you again at the end. So don't feel like you need to copy it down just yet. Um, so I'll be asking for some participation, participation throughout our time together today. Um, just to you know, uh, keep this uh, lively and um, engaging while we're on Zoom. So I would love for you to share in the chat how easily you're able to bring in really authentic real world connections into your math instruction. Um, or if that's a challenge, maybe share a little bit about why that's a challenge or how that's been a challenge for you. And I'm gonna give uh, my great teacher wait time and say, We'll take about one minute to share in the chat um, different thoughts around this question. one comment in the chat maybe sometimes hard to find things um they're good real world examples mm -hmm. so easier when we are really explicitly working with statistical topics maybe a little bit more challenging when those uh, topics aren't quite as explicit, harder to find examples. 
Okay. Oh, great. Cynthia with an altruistic uh, endeavor here to help share with other colleagues. Thanks, Cynthia. Great, that's our minute mark. So um, any other thoughts, please feel free to put those into the chat. Um, but I'm beginning by posing this question because this is really what drives our work here at Tuva. Um, we are really intent on finding ways to bring uh, some, some really great, authentic, real-world applications into the math classroom, and we do that via um, real-world data. And so um, it is very important to us that math instructions feel relevant to what students are observing in the world around them, connected to real-world phenomena, connected to real-world events um, and bringing that into our math instruction. And um, I definitely felt this while I was in the classroom. Algebra 1 obviously has so many real world applications, and yet much of the curriculum that I was given was really devoid of that. Um, and it's something that I also heard from my students and from my parents. Um, this is not one of my personal parents that I worked with. This is based on some research that um, the Global Strategy Group did around what needs to change in math instruction. And you can see here this parent is really, um, you know, expressing the importance to them of math instruction being more relevant for students and helping them actually be prepared for the real world and what they're going to see when they leave um, their K-12 environment. And like I said, this is really what drives us here at Tuva. So our vision as a company, especially on the content team, when we think about the content that we want to create and the data sets that we want to curate, is really this idea that all students are able to enjoy math and science if, and this is sometimes a big if, if they're able to see those connections between what they're learning in the math classroom and what they're experiencing in their daily lives. And we really see real world data as this great connector um, between what we're experiencing in life and what we're doing in the math classroom. Um, I'm going to actually skip over that. So before, I'm going to spend a lot of time actually showing you what Tuva is, um, but I just wanted to kind of summarize for you all what it is we do at Tuva. We kind of think about our instructional program in three parts. Um, the first is we have some really powerful and student-friendly data graphic and statistical tools um, that allow students to explore large chunks of data um, in a really user-friendly way. And those tools are also um, accessibility tested. We're going through a third-party accessibility audit. And so um, we want those tools to be things that all students are able to use in order to, um, you know, be able to play and work with data. The second is that we curate um, real world data sets that are ready to use in the classroom. So teachers don't have to spend a lot of time looking for data sets. As you know, um, as educators, often we spend an inordinate amount of time looking for the perfect resource to use in our classrooms. And so our goal at Tuva is to limit that amount of time that teachers are spending looking for something that's really high quality to be able to use and to be able to have math applications um, that are really readily apparent. And then the third is we also work with teachers um, in, and districts to um, help them implement what we do seamlessly into the curriculum so that this isn't something additional that we're doing on top of the you know, many things that we have to get through in a year, um, but that it can kind of fit seamlessly into what you're already working on in your classroom. Um, so, the goal with Juva is to go from something like this, where this is uh, from a sixth grade lesson where students are asked to construct a dot plot based on um, dog weight. And essentially they're given a list of numbers and they're told to put those numbers onto a dot plot. Probably a very, you know, something we've all seen before when we're teaching dot plots or looking at examples of dot plots. Um, and I don't think there's necessarily anything wrong with this being a part of our instruction. It's important for students to learn, um, you know, kind of the structure of what it is that they're learning. But if this is all they get exposed to, then a dot plot in their mind is this really strange and abstract thing that doesn't really represent an actual tangible thing in the world. It's just like a dot on a number line. 
that corresponds to a list of numbers. Um, when really those numbers are actual cases, those are data cases, those are things we can observe and measure and learn about. So instead of having um, just a static dot plot, Tuva allows students to interact with um, a dot plot, to create a dot plot on their own, to look at all of the different um, cases within our data set and learn more things about them and the relationships between them. Um, so this is kind of like the goal that we see for math instruction, right? Moving from that sort of like static, abstract um, idea of working with data to um, making data more real and tangible for students. So you all um, are likely familiar with the GAZE framework having um, come to an ASA chat. If you're not, it was co-written um, by the lovely Chris Franklin and several others. Um, it's linked here and I'll also share this PowerPoint with you um, if you'd like to refer back. But what we're going to do is um, we're gonna go through the GAZE process or this investigative process together using a Tuva data set. And in so doing, I hope to demonstrate to you all, all the different tools that we have um, that allow students to work with data. Um, so we are gonna look at a data set about roller coasters. Um, I'm not gonna tell you what is in that data set yet. We're gonna see that data set in just a minute. But before we actually look at the data set, I want to begin with that initial step in the um, framework. And we are gonna kind of go through this in like a linear way, even though we know that framework, that case framework does not have to happen linearly. We're gonna kind of go through it linearly just for the, um, the sake of time today. But I would like us to generate some statistical or investigative questions um, and or investigative questions that we can, that we may wanna know about a data set about roller coasters. So I'll give us another minute of time and just maybe think there's no wrong ideas in the brainstorm, right? We'll just think of some statistical or investigative questions that we wanna know about roller coasters. Okay. Hey, speed. Great. Ooh, more than two loops, which are faster wooden or steel. Awesome. Duration of the roller coaster ride. Okay. Distribution of largest drops, relationship to number of annual riders. Ooh, cool. Ooh, accident records. <laughs> Spoiler alert, we don't have accident records in this data set, but that would be really interesting. The age of the structure is great. Right. Well, these are some great questions. So we did, you know, kind of step one, you can kind of imagine um, having students create these questions as well. Um, and then you can either have students collect their own data or we uh, actually have a data set. We have a couple of data sets actually um, involving roller coasters. I'm going to show you, I'm going to start with one, which is um, a little bit of a smaller data set. And then we have a larger parent version of this data set as well. I'm gonna start with the smaller one just because my screen tends to get a little bit glitchy. It's my Zoom issue when I'm dealing with larger data sets. Um, but here's the first data set that we'll look at and we'll try to answer some of those questions that we generated in the chat. So this is um, a data set on US roller coasters only. We can see that we have 20 cases and we've collected six attributes about these data, about these um, roller coasters. Um, and over here we have different tags is how we kind of organize our data set library, which I'll show you in just a few moments. Um, 
but there are lots of great applications for this data set. If you're someone who teaches um, in middle school, this will also have connections to middle, middle school physical science. Similarly, in high school, this has some great connections to high school physical science as well. In terms of math applications, we can do a lot of stuff um, with this data set. So I heard, um, or I saw, what about the height of roller coasters? So um, what you see on my screen, um, to give you a little introduction, then we'll look at height to begin with. So when you arrive in Tuba, um, you'll notice the screen is kind of divided up into three pieces. On the left side, we have our data set, which we represent um, most often as a case card. Um, so we can scroll through the case card and case cards and see each of the individual cases in our data set. Um, but students are also probably really familiar with looking at data in a tabular view. And so we can also view um, in this graphing area, which is the middle section of my screen, the table view of our data set. So here's our table view. And um, what's really great about Tuva is that the case card view, the tabular view, and this graphing area in the middle are all linked so that if I select case number three, case number three is represented as a, um, a case in this graphing area. I also see it highlighted in the tabular view, and I see it over here as a case card. Um, and so once students get familiar with the fact that I can represent data, not just as a row in a spreadsheet, but I can represent it in this case view in the graphing and as a case card, they don't generally look at the table view. They kind of keep that minimized um, while they're working because it's just not really necessary. Um, so, uh, and then the thing over here on the right, this panel on the right is where we have all of our content that relates to this data set. So if you wanted to find a lesson on, um, that uses this roller coaster data set, it would be over here on the right. I'm gonna minimize this for now because I want us to just look at the data set. And we're going to begin by looking at the distribution of heights. So I'm going to drag and drop height onto the x-axis. Um, I could drop it on either axes, but we're more kind of familiar with looking at on the x-axis. And immediately I have a dot plot distribution of all of the heights of the roller coasters in this data set. And so now I can have, you know, we can have conversations with students about what do we notice about this data set? How spread out is it? So we can talk about variability really easily. Um, we notice that this value over here on the right, maybe it's an outlier, maybe it's not. We might have to do some analysis to see if that's the case. Um, but really easily students have been able to create a graph. Um, what were some of the other questions we had? We had some questions about speed. So I, um, I know we had a question about whether steel roller coasters or wooden roller coasters are faster. And in this data set, we have collected information on the construction material. So I'm going to take speed and put it on the x-axis to replace height. So now I can see a dis the distribution of all of the speeds of my data set. And I can also take the construction material and I can either click on it once and now I'm able to visually see the difference um, just by color coding the graph. Or I can also take this and drop it, construction material and drop it to the Y axis and I have two parallel bot, um, dot plots that allows me to look at the speed. So this is, dot plots obviously give us a visual representation of what our distribution is, but maybe we want students to have to start to quantify the difference between these two subpopulations of our data set. And so if we want to be able to quantify it, we want to use a different graph type other than a distribute other than a dot plot, or we want to also maybe add on some statistical measures. So I'm going to add in mean and median and show those labels. And I'm also going to switch this from a dot plot to a box plot. We have three different types of box plots that we support in Cuba. We have one just like a standard box plot. We can overlay a box plot on top of our dot plot if we want students to sort of understand where the dot plot comes from. 
um, dot pucks can be very convoluted for students. There's obviously a formula of figuring out how we can get that five number summary, but they don't always understand what the different quartiles are representing. And so I like the, the dot plot and the box plot overlaid for them to be able to see the each quartile has the same number of data points inside of it um, so that they're really developing that conceptual understanding of a box plot. We can also do a box plot with outliers to see if there are any extreme values in our data set. Um, and then what I, you know, one thing we love to emphasize in our, um, our lessons is tends to be a little bit uh, earlier, like in middle school, when students are learning the different types of measures of center and how outliers affect that, but also something that gets reinforced in statistics and AP statistics as well. So what happens if we have this one extreme value and we want to take it away um, we can filter it out of the data set and then see how it affects the mean and the median of that, um, those wood roller coasters. So off the bat, within, you know, just a few um, clicks, we're able to have, we're first of all able to answer some of those questions that we had, you know, assuming that this is a somewhat relatively um, representative sample that we could use in order to answer those questions. Um, and we're able to have some great conversations and maybe spark, spark some additional questions um, that students might have. Um, I wanna show you all also the larger version of this data set, um, which is available in our, the, our tools um, are completely free to use. So um, when you log on to Tuba, actually before you even log on, you have the ability to access um, the Tuba tools. And within those two tools, we have some sample data sets that you can play around with without ever needing to even like make an account on Tuba. You can play around with these data sets. And one of those is our roller coasters data set. This is a larger parent of the data set I just showed you. And it does have um, a couple of additional, oh no, same number of attributes, um, but a lot more cases. So we have 408 cases, so it might be a little bit more representative of all of the roller coasters around the world so we can kind of see does that change um, our distribution at all or does that uh, does it change the conclusions that we may draw um, so that is even a conversation you could have with students um, using different versions of the same data set are there uh, you know differences in what we notice or the conclusions that we might make um, as a result of having a much larger sample. Um, let me see what other questions we had in the chat. All right. And I didn't then, see any, Colleen. Okay. So I do want to answer a couple more of our um, investigative questions. I'm going to pause my share for just one second, just because my computer freaks out. We do have we do also have a version of this data set that has some additional um, additional attributes that also have some physics applications. So um, if any of you um, work in the high school setting and may have students who are currently taking physics or ha who have taken physics, um, this data set you can access with a free account. It's um, not one of our sample data sets that you can access without logging in. This one you do have to log in, but you can log in and use it totally for free. So you don't have to pay for this data set at all. Um, but someone asked about number of inversions. So I'm just curious. I want to be able to answer that question or at least look at that question. Um, so this one has, okay, data set, or this has data on the number of inversions of these 400 um, roller coasters. And I think someone asked about the percentage that has, was it like two or more or something like that? So, okay, so there are a few different ways, obviously, that we can calculate um, percent or we can like visualize percent with data. Um, we could do that by using like a stretched bar chart, um, or we could do that by using a pie graph. So we support both of those. So look, um, at number of inversions. And before I do that, I can just switch this 
number of inversions and we'll make it a categorical variable since we only have a few options. Great. Okay, so. All right, so let's look. Number of inversions. Okay, so of our um, 408 roller coasters, the vast majority of them have no inversions. Um, but let's see if we wanted to know the percent by pie section. We could see, um, let's see if we wanted to know two, two inversions exactly, that was 4.7% of our data set. Um, and this is a pretty large data set, so we could say this is probably significantly more representative than that smaller version of the data set that I showed you. Um, let's say we wanted to visualize this as a stretched bar chart, another way for us to look at um, the proportion of the data set. So this is another way we could visualize that for students and see how many inversions um, we had. We can also, we can do this for any categorical variable. So we could also say, okay, I'm curious about um, what percentage of these roller coasters are in North America? Is it North America have more roller coasters than other regions? So let's see. Okay, so little more than half of our roller coasters come from North America. So maybe, and I would imagine, you know, given that the United States makes up a large portion of that, maybe many of those are in the United States and maybe we're just, um, adrenaline junkies over here or something and that explains why there are so many of them show up in North America. Um, since I know we do have some um, statistics folks in the room, I also want to show you all some of the, um, the tools that we have that are really directly applicable for a lot of you in the high school like statistics setting. So um, a few things that um, might be really helpful let's pick a numerical lottery we haven't looked at length yet so let's pick a length um i think someone did ask about length too so we'll see what the distribution looks like all right so okay so you pretty right um so a few things that probably will get used a lot in the stats classroom um obviously this whole stats menu of our toolbar shows you all of the different statistical measures that we can take from this distribution. Um, we can do, uh, you know, obviously we can do interquartile range because I showed you all box plots, so we support that as well. Um, we can do uh, standard deviation, and uh, we also have the ability to do multiple standard deviations if that's helpful. Um, so we can see one standard deviation, two standard deviations, three standard deviations, um, we can also give those labels so students can see um, what that standard, devia standard deviation is um, from the mean. And obviously, it'd be great if we could also, if I also had the mean on, sorry, not the median, the mean. Um, so we can see, uh, you know, where those standard deviations are beginning from. Um, one thing I also uh, think is a really helpful tool to get students to understand um, conceptually what standard deviation actually is, is uh, so let's say we have the mean, um, we can also use these dividers and have students um, move these dividers around and also look at the percentage of cases that fall into, fall into those dividers. So we can have students start to actually conceptually understand and visualize what the standard deviation looks like before then we go ahead and layer on what the standard deviation is. So have students play around with those movable bars so that they can um, get that uh, conceptual understanding first. Another thing um, that I think will be really helpful to, um, to our staff folks, get rid of my dividers, is our um, sampling card. So uh, we do support random sampling um, and there we have you know lots of different things that students are able to make decisions around when they're creating a sample from their data. So they can decide whether or not they want replacement um, 
And then we all, you, they also have the ability to decide how large their sample size is going to be, how many samples they want to run at a time, and then which sample statistics they want statistic they want to to see. Um, and then they can generate that sample, um, and they'll see below the graphing area all of their different sample statistics and be able then to compare all of those sample means to our population mean. Um, so really helpful for those of you who are you know, teaching inferential statistics um, to be able to actually have students generate their, their, own, um, pop, um, their own samples. We also do have some really great free lessons um, that help students go through this process. So give them kind of like that scaffolding to use our sampling tool and then also um, help them sort of investigate this idea of the central limit theorem through generating their own samples and seeing how those compare to the um, population mean. And I think what's great about this tool is that um, we're not just having students do that in the abstract. They actually are doing it with large amounts of data, like more data than they would be able to work with on their own by hand. Um, so they're actually getting to do, be a part of that process um, on their own. We do also, I mean, at, there are lots of tools up here that I didn't get to, but that I'm happy to talk through if they're helpful. Um, we have three different kinds of histograms, five different types of bar charts. Um, for anyone who may use the mapping capabilities, we do have the ability to do lat long coordinates. Um, so you're able to uh, drop those if you have a data set that has lat long or you use one of our data sets that has lot long coordinates, they can visualize those data points on the um, on a map. Um, and then we also have the ability to do um, line graphs over time, um, which isn't super appropriate for this, although we do have um, year open, so you know we could make a little. you all for being patient with my slow computer. Okay, so this isn't the best use of a line graph, but hopefully you all kind of get the picture of um, we're looking at duration over time, but not, not the best use of a line graph. Um, but anytime we have something over time, we're able to create that, we have that functionality to be able to do that, um, to look at those data over time. Um, one more thing I want to share with you all before I open up for questions, because I do want to leave time to answer any questions that you might have or demo any other tools that might be helpful for you all. Um, I just wanted to share um, that we have aligned um, some lessons to the GAZE framework. And we have those in the form of um, what are what we call data stories, which are um, kind of just short investigations that students can um, engage in that are not really tied to standards. They're more tied to mathematical concepts and to data reasoning. And um, right now we have four gaze aligned lessons. I'll drop this link into the chat in just a moment, but I'll show you what it looks like in our content library. So we have four gaze aligned lessons, two level A and two level B, and we'll also shortly have some level C examples as well. Um, but all of them are organized around an investigative question that students are trying to answer throughout the, um, looking at the data set. And they all, all of these examples also come from the appendices of the gaze framework. So, um, so you know they're good stuff because they were written by uh, Chris et al. Um, so would love for you to, um, to check those out. They are always, will remain free um, forever. So they will never be behind a paywall. You all can access that with um, any kind of free account. So I will share that link in the chat. I'm gonna stop my share for now and open it up for questions, any questions that you all may have for me. And please feel free to either drop those in the chat or if you're feeling brave, go ahead and take yourself off of mute.
I'll ask a question. <laughs> sure. How how exactly do the data stories work? Mm -hmm. Or do you take the yeah. students through a series of questions? Or is it just uh, how exactly are the data stories set up? Great question. So there are, so our gaze aligned data stories will have students answer an investigative question by going through a series of data moves. And um, they're, they're, the ones that we have now are pretty scaffolded because they're level A and B. But yes, essentially they'll just answer, they answer a series of questions that help them um, to answer that investigative question. So for example, um, one of the ones you'll see on there that's a level B is um, how long does it typically take students to get to school? And students are asking that question. Um, I actually kind of made this situation a little bit different from what it was in the Gates framework, but the, the situation is a school is trying to decide if they need to push back their start time by looking at how long it takes students to travel to school. And so they're given some data and asked to, you know, answer some questions based on the data and ultimately make a little, a small recommendation about what they should do. Another one that comes out of the gaze framework is um, there's a PTA trying to um, decide if they should sell sweatshirts and sweatpants as a combination or if they should sell them separately based on the association between um, arm span and height. And so students are trying to help the PTA answer that question by looking at the association and determining how strong that association is. Um, some of our other data stories, we've aligned to different instructional strategies that get used frequently in math and also in science. Um, and so those tend to be structured around like a particular strategy with a mathematical concept and data um, weaved in. Does that answer your question, Chris? It did. Great. Um, I saw a question about iPads. I uh, just quick answer. Yes, Juba works on iPads. Somebody is off mute. Matthew, do you have a question? I'm back to data stories again. Do you okay. see those being used for uh, formative assessment in the classroom, or do you have assessment tools with Tuva? Yeah, that's a great question. I think data stories more get used for um, for like either uh, a way to like a launch activity for a lesson, um, a way to like get students engaged at the beginning and then move on to the lesson or often used in sort of a flipped classroom, classroom method of like homework assignment that might preview something that gets done in the classroom. Um, we do have some assessment tools that we're developing, but um, right now they're just on the science side. We do see teachers using our activities as formative assessments um, because they do, um, teachers have the ability to grade those and give students feedback. And so those are, great little formative assessment tools. Um, happy to demo what that looks like um, for teachers, what that assignment, you know, assigning an activity and then grading it looks like if that, if anyone's interested in that, happy to do that. Um, but that I think is how students are using or how teachers are using them for formative assessments for now. Um, Cynthia asked, is there a way to search just free activities? Yes, there is. Let me go ahead and show you that. So from our um, from our content library, um, you can go to this drop down menu right here, and in our math library, you can see just our free lessons. If you click on free math lessons, that'll take you to um, both data stories and activities, and so you can just um, filter up here at the top for just activities and see all of our free activities. Um, so we've gotten our free content to what we feel like is a pretty stable place um, because we want teachers to be able to use an activity 
over time um, and not have it disappear. So the free content that you see here is likely to stay free for you know, the foreseeable future. Um, so you don't have to worry about liking something and then it disappearing because um, that's always such a bummer when that happens. Um, but as you can see, just looking through some of our free content, we really try not to just focus on things that we know are explicitly talking about data. So we all have standards or, um, you know, course objectives that speak specifically to data. But someone made a point in the chat earlier, but it's a little bit harder to find those examples that are, you know, not just the data standards. And so one of our real goals in content creation at Tuba is to be able to take um, math, other math lessons, like let's say you're teaching, um, you know, proportional relationships or something in middle school, um, that we can teach that through data as well. We're teaching, um, you know, quadratic or exponential modeling. Um, this, for example, this lesson here on the Super Bowl, cost of the Super Bowl. Um, first of all, it's insane to see how much it costs to run a 30 second ad these days. It's something like $7 million just for 30 seconds which is kind of insane, um, but it's also really great um, exponential modeling um, activity because students can really see, I mean, the, the model is just like, whoop, <laughs> it is wild. Um, but also it's, you know, interesting because we all love Super Bowl ads. They're so great and entertaining. Um, so, but again, we try to cover topics that, um, you know, just kind of appear in the natural course of, of teaching math and not just those that are, you know, just about just about data. Um, for any of our statistics folks, this is a great lesson um, teaching distribution um, and normality. Um, this is another great uh, nonlinear modeling for those of you teaching like Algebra 2-ish. Um, yeah, so, and I hope that you're seeing in the different kind of topics that we cover here that we try for them to be really relatable um, for students and things that kids can actually connect to and find meaning from, um, you know, rather than just uh, like, like we said in the beginning, like abstract set of numbers that don't really have any meaning to anybody. Um, so this is all of our free content. I guess one other thing I would love to show you all um, that I was planning to show you is our data set library. So we were previously in our content library, which is all the lessons and curriculum that we've developed. Um, but we also do have some data sets um, that you can use in your classroom. Um, and we have a lot of free data sets. Um, so 52 free data sets right now. And again, we try to keep most of these pretty stable so that they will always be free. We do have some that we feature when things are topical um, and those are free usually for a few weeks at a time. Um, so just give you, I'll just give you some, uh, a feel for what we offer in our free content library. Um, this content library, the, I'm sorry, our free data set library. Our data set library spans across math and science. So you'll see lots of science applications in here. Um, but what we try to do is also tag, um, you know, what type of data this is and some of the applications of this data set. So we're never going to post a data set that doesn't have some sort of meaningful insight that students are able to look at because there's really no point in having students look at a data set that doesn't have something really meaningful um, that they can investigate. So we'll try to tag those um, over here. You'll see these all these different tags. And um, we try to make it really clear, like when there's an application for a specific content area. Um, for math, what's, one thing that's really great about, you know, using data for math is that we don't have to um, really worry about the content of the data. There's almost always some sort of mathematical insight that we can glean, or at least ask questions about in our investigative process, and then apply some sort of um, mathematical model on top of that. Um, do students have to make accounts to use Tuva? Um, yeah, so they will, they also make um, student accounts that are um, like fully encrypted privacy wise. So we follow, you know, all of the same um, high level of encryption and student privacy that any major um, 
any major like ed tech company would. So student accounts have really high levels of privacy. They can um, make an account just by uh, getting a code from a teacher. So if you're a teacher and you create a class, you can just share that code with your students and they follow that link or use that join code and, and um, can really easily make an account. Um, and every teacher and student um, with our free account has five data set uploads. Um, so in addition to using our free data set, you can also upload your own data set if you already have data that you work with or if you want students to collect their own data. You can upload five data sets um, with your free account. And that's for every single one of your students. They can upload five data sets and you can upload five data sets. So lots of data sets to go around. Um, super easy to do that. Um, this is a very, I think, self-explanatory process. You can upload it from your computer, or if you want to just insert it directly into Tuba, let's say um, you know, you're having students collect data in real time, then rather than collecting it in a spreadsheet and then taking that spreadsheet and moving it into Tuba, they can actually just use our tabular view down here and actually insert the data um, directly into Tuba. And then as they do that, oops, thing in the chat, not in my window. Um, we can start to see the cases actually appear as we insert them into, into the table. So um, lots of different possibilities. Um, if you're at all excited about working with data, um, give our free account a try because there's so many capabilities that you can do without ever registering for premium. Um, and then, you know, if there's more that you want to explore and you want to look into premium, then look into premium. Um, okay, let me pause again and see if we have any other questions. I'll just hang out on this dashboard here for a second. Um, I think having used a number of different technologies in the classroom, I think that um, it is very self-explanatory and easy to create a class on Tuba. Um, and then also, if you are a school that uses Clever, you can just authenticate using Clever and pull in your classroom, your classroom rosters from there. Um, similarly, if you use Google, Google Classroom, you can also do that as well. So you're not manually creating any of your rosters. Or once you create a class, um, you know, if you'd rather just share the code with your students, they can join that way as well. Um, and they just, it's literally just, you know, they, you have a link, uh, you can copy and paste that link into your LMS, or you can, you know, manually give the code to your students and they can join as well. Um, any other questions? I noticed on your dashboard here about your Zoom office hours. Is oh. is that something that is free for students or is there so anyone could utilize those? Yeah, anyone could. Um, they're intended for teachers, but students could absolutely join too. We just have um we we just started this actually, so they're new and open to suggestions if anyone has them about how they could be more useful to teachers. But um, we are essentially going to try to do alternating weeks between math and science. So I will run the math ones. My science counterpart will run the science. And it's just an open hour of time where teachers can log on and ask questions, whether it's just like, a, hey, I just need to see how to do this one thing really quickly. Or if it's like, I actually want to walk through how to, you know, integrate this lesson into what I'm already doing in my classroom, we're available for that. So um, we would love to see any of you there. Uh, the next one will be not till December, just because we have the holiday week coming up. And then our team is traveling the following week. So we'll resume in December, we'll do two office hours in December, and then we'll pick up again after the, the new year. Um, we do offer also a lot of professional development. So um, we have in the past hosted a ton of webinars. Um, you can see those previously recorded webinars here. Um, 
they are across math and science. So, um, you know, absolutely check those out. Uh, we try to answer, you know, questions that people have or think about ways to teach data through um, different content areas. And also, I'll just point out that we also have a number of tutorials that allow you to learn different aspects of our tools. Um, our tools are pretty self-explanatory, but if you wanna get into, for example, um, like the modeling function, functionality of our tools, or um, you, know, you wanna refresh on when, we, you know, when it might be appropriate to have students use different types of histograms or you know, whatever. Um, then in our tools, we have a full library of tutorials. And these are really great. I know when I started and I was um, learning the tools for the first time myself, I did a lot of these tutorials and they will just walk you through different um, tool types that we have um, and how to use them. And also I think what I found helpful is not just like how to use the tools, but they get you thinking about when I would ask students to use these different functions. Um, so like kind of pedagogically, when does it make sense to have students use these different um, tool types? So those are super helpful and you can find them within our Chupa tool when also in the help section of our page. Um, the last thing I'll mention, and I think this is, um, you know, I, I, I like to suggest that people get to know our content and our data set first, and then try to dry, dive in and create your own activity. But if you're like ready to go and you find a data set in our library that doesn't have an activity that meets your needs, you can create your own activity um, based on one of our free data sets and then assign that to your students. So um, it's a pretty, pretty straightforward activity builder, but I just would suggest if you have never done a tuba lesson before to do a few of those either on your own or with your students just to get a feel for how they're structured um, so that you know sort of how to use our tools and then how to direct students to use our tools. But that functionality is there for you. I know when I was in the classroom, I almost never used anything out of the box. I would always customize it in some way so I know that that's something that is really helpful. Um, so that, that is there for you if you see one of the data sets and you're like, that's a great data set, but you guys don't have a lesson that really fits what it is that I'm trying to teach, make your own lesson. Um, and then once you make that lesson, it's gonna stay private to you unless you wanna share it with someone else in your school. And then you have the ability to do that. Okay, that was a lot of information. I hope I didn't feel like um, drinking through a fire hose, but um, I am going to share with you all my contact information. Um, I'm also going to share with you a link to my slides, um, just so that you have all of the links that I shared in here in one place. So here is my contact information, and then grab a link to our slides. Um, so that you all have that. And again, I just want to um, emphasize that my door is always open. I love to chat with teachers about ways that they can integrate data into what they're already doing. Um, I'm obviously like very passionate about this topic. And um, so I'd love to talk with you further if you want to schedule some time to hop on a call and go through more of the tools in depth. I'm happy to do that. Um, or just talk through some of our free content and our lessons, I'm also happy to do that. Um, even if you just have a small question, please feel free to shoot me an email and I'll get back to you as soon as I can. Great, Cynthia. Please let me know if you have questions when you try it out. I would love to help you. Well, Colleen, thank you so much. This is this is wonderful. And I'm, I'm looking forward to exploring more, especially the Gaze 2 lesson data stories. <laughs> I can't we wait really, to hear your thoughts on that. We really appreciate you taking the Gaze 2 document and creating some data stories around some of the examples. Well, thank you yeah, everyone great for joining us. Colleen, thank you again. And we'll resume our K-12 chats uh, in January 
after the holiday season. So I'm going to wish everybody a happy Thanksgiving and a happy December and a break from the school year. <laughs> yes, much deserved. Much deserved. Well, good evening or good afternoon, depending on where you are. <laughs> Bye-bye. Thank you.